Mosquito Lagoon is one of the last strongholds for oysters in the lagoon system. And the lagoon system is really the 156 mile long lagoon that encompasses the Indian River Lagoon, the Mosquito Lagoon, and the Banana River. So it's a system of water bodies. This is the last stronghold of really healthy oyster reefs in the Mosquito Lagoon until you get down to the very south end in the Loxahatchee River area where they have some more oysters there that are fairly healthy. What we find, see how it creates, and almost all of them are creating this horseshoe shape. There, this was all live reef, and probably live reef in the back. When you go out and see these, what you'll find is it starts getting mucky back here. The seagrass starts disappearing. And so it's not only just the oyster reef itself that's dying, it's the whole system that's around it. And it's typically up against mangrove too. Oyster losses are a huge problem throughout the U.S., um, especially on the eastern seaboard. Um, up in the Chesapeake, there's oysters have declined to almost zero. There it's been over harvesting and diseases have been the main problems. Once we've gotten down here into Florida, um, especially in this national park, harvesting does happen, but it's very limited. And we've tested for all the known oyster diseases and some of them do not exist at all here because it's too hot, most likely. Other ones are found in very low levels, um, levels that would not kill the oysters. Whenever a wake is generated, that is enough to push oysters around, and if it pushes them so that they are above the high tide mark, then they will die, and they start piling up at that point. Very important with restoration is you have to match your restoration to your habitat. Uh, we knew the oysters were moving, and so we wanted something to keep shells in place. Oysters are gregarious, so they settle on other oysters, and we knew that. So we wanted to give them a substrate that would stay put. So we have them attached to mesh. Um, we also wanted them to be in the natural orientation that you'll find oysters in the lagoon, and that is um, perpendicular to here's the bottom, here's how the oysters are supposed to be set up. And we also promised the park we would make the restoration invisible so that people boating by would not see bags of shells or other things that they've tried in other places. We cable tie the mat to a weight, okay, which helps hold the mat in place, allows the uh, um, mat to stay hooked together and held down by the weight, but it also hooks the mat to the weight, which then hooked to other mats, and so we create one big, huge mat covering the whole oyster reef. Now, individual mats, when we've tested them in, uh, previously, have held in place very well with the, even during hurricanes, um, partly because the water level comes up. But what this does is help hold overall in a much larger area in place and prevents the uh, loose shells from being washed back up and piling up into the dead margin and also burying these. Four of the mats together covers about a square meter. One of our largest reefs uses over, I think, 1,500 mats. Um, this one will probably take 700 mats to cover this. That once the mats are deployed so that they are kind of in the lower end of the intertidal zone, oyster larvae that are in the water um, floating around, they will come in contact and they will settle on the, our shells and they will just keep growing and over time they will form a reef by the new oysters that have recruited growing from one of our shells to the next and we call those bridges. If you're just looking at a healthy oyster reef you'd call that an oyster cluster. So that's when you've got the refuges for the other species to come in and, and do better in their survival. We restored seven reefs last summer and put out just over 3,500 mats. We've gone back last month and counted how many new oysters were on each of these mats, and we found an average of um, 34 oyster, new oysters per mat after six months. We compare that to the number of just any size live oysters on a healthy oyster reef, and the average for that in the same season was 93 oysters. So we're about a third the number of oysters that we're hoping to get. And after six months, we're, we're very happy with that. As soon as you put our oyster mats down, you have um, the exact same amount of biodiversity that you will have on a pristine oyster reef. And what we found is there are between 100 and 110 species that will frequent our mats and the pristine oyster reefs. 
Um, so we're always looking for volunteers that can help um, make mats or drill shells or um, come out and help with our deployments. And I mean, last summer, 5,100 people helped. So that's a good number of people that now know more about oysters than they did before they came out with us. Only boating regulations currently in effect are for manatees. Um, they have no wake zones for manatees, and those are incredibly important for that species. I don't know whether we'll ever have oyster no wake zones. We've put signs out where we are doing restoration, and that does slow people down. Hard because they want to read the sign, but. I don't predict there will be no wake zones for oysters um, or any way to enforce it if they did put them in. It's more of an educational outreach sort of um, objective rather than a regulation or enforcement. And what we found is that if you stay further away from the oyster reefs, if you stay closer to the center of the channel, you, your wake will be dissipated before it gets to shore. So speed is less of an issue than distance from shore. Um, and we're trying to promote that.